Okay, welcome to the Orange and Blue News uh, podcast. Um, Illinois survives today, travel up to Madison, Wisconsin at the Kohl Center, uh, hangs on to beat Wisconsin 74 to 69. A lot of drama at the end of the game, but at the end of the day, a big win for Illinois on the road, improving to 14 and four in a conference, 18 and 16 overall, and probably looking to hang on to the number five national ranking when the, when the rankings come out on Monday. Uh, I'm Doug Bouchon from Orange and Blue News. We have uh, Jim Cotter and Alec Bussey. Uh, and we're, we have a guest in again, Mike Latula, former Illinois player. And Mike, um, a big win for him, a lot of drama at the end, a little bit of nail biting at the end of the game. But what did you see from the Illini today? Yeah, I thought it was a culture win. Um, you know, it was a program win. It was a culture win, whatever, whatever you want to call it. When you have moments like that where, you know, where IO's out and there's a lot at stake and you're going into Madison, a place that, Aside from last year, I mean, I know, I know we didn't win there when I was there, um, when I was at Illinois. So uh, it's a big deal no matter, no matter what kind of Wisconsin team it is uh, to win up there. Not many teams do win up there. And um, I thought they got off to a great start, uh, aside from maybe the turnovers. And I think any time you go into a game, you say, hey, we want to get off to a great start. And they did that today. And, they did, and that's, that's how you beat Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin's not built to come back uh, from deficits. That's just not the way their team's designed. It's not the way, um, you know, it's not the way that their system's designed. So, um, you know, you, that's why time and time again, you see when teams get down against Wisconsin, uh, it's tough to claw back into it. But the, the flip side of it is they struggle, um, you know, to erase those deficits. So, uh, so yeah, no, I thought, I thought, and I thought they maintained it the entire game. Um, you know, they kept them at bay for a while there until Trice started throwing those threes in at the end. And, and at that point, there's really nothing you can do. You know, I had some people, tweeting at me saying, hey, how, how is it not in anybody else's hands besides Trice? I mean, I think you live, you live with some fadeaway shots that, that bank in because at the end of the day, you're not going to go double them, uh, you know, and leave a guy open for an even easier shot and even, even more wide open shot. So, uh, and, and the thing I was most impressed with was, was how they closed from the free throw line. Uh, I thought that was fantastic. I thought for a team that, that generally doesn't shoot the ball particularly well from the free throw line, they were able to to step up and knock it down at the end, knock all those down. Um, I don't know what they ended up being there at the end, eight for eight or 10 for 10. Um, but it was a huge reason why they won this game. Uh, and, and obviously Brad Underwood was, was excited and rightfully so. I mean, that's, you keep the number one seed hopes alive and, um, and you're also up there and you never know what could happen here in the last, last few games. I know Michigan kind of looks like they're running away with the, you know, with at least a share of the title, but crazier things have happened. Take care of business on Tuesday and, you know, you're you're in the game, so. Yeah, the, uh, Kofi Coburn, another big game. Only played 25 minutes, but uh, made had 19 points, seven rebounds. Andre Cabello came in, uh, 17 points. A lot of rebounds. A kid can really jump off of two feet and go get the ball uh, off the glass, uh, but six turnovers. And uh, I wanted to ask you about that a little bit, Mike. It seems you know, Coach Underwood's not really known as a patient guy. A patient guy. It's not really his mo, but. With Andrew Carbello, the way he's bringing him along, he's been remarkably patient. When he'll make a big turnover, he'll come out of the game, get a little bit of lecture on the bench, and then he'll throw him back right in there at a critical t point in the game and, and lets him ride the games out at the end. Uh, it, do you agree with the way he's developing this kid, trying not to break his confidence and putting him in, in the big spots in critical games? Well, I always think back to, to the psyche of a player – uh, you look at a guy like Andre Curbelo and when I'm sure in his basketball career, he's never been in a situation like this where he's coming off the bench where he's not the guy that has the keys to the car. Uh, and, and I think that doesn't get talked about enough in terms of what that can do for a player's psyche who, who typically is, I know everybody keeps saying like, he's, he's a, he's an alpha by nature. He's an alpha by nature, but you know, it's just, it's just a comfortability thing. Uh, and I'm sure Andre Corbello has never once second guessed his abilities ever in his career. And I'm sure there's been times this year where he's done that. So those are, those are the hurdles and the, the, the ebbs and flows of, of being a freshman. But, uh, you know, I look at the six turnovers he had today, a couple of them were, weren't live ball turnovers. I mean, he had a couple, you know, traveling, I think he had maybe two traveling calls. You want to limit the live ball turnovers. He had a couple of their break in the press where, you know, just a miscommunication between he and Trent where he, where he overthrew it. But, um, but I do think that he makes enough winning plays to earn, you know, the right to be on the court. And, and he's, I think he's a better free throw shooter than 71%, just like I think he's a better three-point shooter than, 
whatever he is right now, 17%. Um, you know, so that's why he's in there at the end of the game. And as much as I think it drives Illini fans crazy, um, you know, he, he makes a ton of winning plays that, quite frankly, other guys just can't make. Uh, you know, and that's, and that's why he's in there as much as he is. And that's why the leash – can be a little bit longer, but we've seen a short leash with him at times, depending on the game. And this was just a game where you ne you needed to let him ride it out. And, and that's what Coach Underwood did. And, and it proved beneficial at the end. I mean, he had the steal and the dunk and, uh, you know, a couple of big buckets there at the end and, and, and obviously knocked down the free throw. So uh, he's a guy that's just going to keep growing. And, and you're starting to see glimpses of, you know, he had 17 and seven today. And I, I didn't think he played particularly well, um, which is scary to think about. So moving forward, that's just, it's another learning experience for him where, yes, he's rebounding the ball at a high level, very high level for a 6'1 guard. Um, but going into March, having him just at, at peak confidence, uh, especially when Io comes back, DeMonte's starting to expand his, his arsenal a little bit. And he's always had that. I mean, anybody that's watched him in high school um, knows he has that to his game. So uh, I, I think they're continuing to click at the right time and, and bringing some other guys along and, uh, but with Andre Curbelo, uh, he's just a guy that, that you have to let – you have to let him go. Um, you know, you have to let him run wild. So, uh, I thought he had some timely plays there at the end. Uh, Brad Sturdy, our basketball guy, has joined us now too. And, Brad, I'd like you to jump in on this next question I have for Mike. And that's, you know, Kofi got the points. Curbelo got 17 points. But uh, what Trent Frazier did today, uh, I thought uh, – I'm going to put the MVP tag on him for today's game and what he did defensively up until Trice got hot at the end when they started switching um, was just was amazing. And this is a guy who came into the program having to be a, the points getter for this team. And he still can get points when he's hunting shots, leave him open in the corner. He's going to knock down threes, but 39 minutes on the court today, locked down defense, made winning plays, made free throws at the end. So it pro proved me wrong. Was, was Trent Frazier the MVP today? Well, I, I don't know if I'd go quite that far because Kofi Coburn's still out there and no one, and he's a he's a dominant force. But I thought Trent's defense was fantastic. He was he was amazing. Trice, he, he, and just like you mentioned, it was when they started switching the screens. They actually Trice hit a three over Demonte, and he was able to get also hit two, get into the paint and get draw fouls on Kofi, and and get some free throws to kind of get a rhythm there. And then he, even when Trent was guarding, he did bank one in there at the end. But I, I thought Trent was fantastic guarding Trice. And, and that's the kind of thing. And, and he has even a bigger uh, role now because in the past, they've been able to rotate those guys. That Io will take Trice for a few possessions to give Trent a little bit of a break. They, don't, they can't do that now. So now it's just Trent locked on the best guard on the other team. And he was great. What he's the best at, though, I think he's the best guy maybe in the country at not getting screened. He gets through screens, fights – oh, he doesn't go under screens either. He fights over the top and through every single screen that comes on. So it's almost impossible to get through um, – get to, to really get those pull-up shots. He makes him take long twos with pull-ups, contested shots, and that's why he's uh, – I think he's definitely a first-team All-Big Ten defender. Yeah, Mike, uh, have, have you been in this situation before that they're in now where you have a star player – you know, sideline for one particular reason or another. With IO, it's you know the facial injury, broken nose. Have, have you have, have you been on a team that's been in that situation where the supporting cast has got to step up uh, to keep to keep winning basketball games? And and these guys have really stepped up two two wins in a row with IO sitting uh, playing pretty well. Can you can you look back and remember a team like that when you were on? Yeah, I mean, I think back to the fourteen fifteen season. Uh, Ravante Rice got injured. Uh, and we played the number nine ranked Maryland team uh, the next game uh, right after he broke his hand. And, uh, and we beat him because, you know, there were certain guys on the team that maybe were taking a little bit of a backseat to, you know, to Ray and, and specifically Malcolm and Kendrick. And I, I don't say that to say that there's guys on this Illinois team that have been taking a backseat to Iowa because I think Iowa is a big reason why you know, when he instills you know, the accountability in that locker room and the leadership in that locker room, it's almost, it's exactly what you want out of a star player because when he goes down, all those guys know what to do and, and they're not looking around. Where's IO, you know, Trent's commanding the huddle, Trent's getting guys together. And, and I think that's such an important distinction because even, even back in 2014, 2015, Ray goes down 
and I believe we won like six of our next eight. Um, and that's not to say that we were a better team without Ravante Rice. It was just we had certain guys on that team that really knew they needed to step up and started to believe a little bit more in themselves. And that, that was Malcolm and Kendrick specifically. And we go to the Breslin Center and beat Michigan State and, and, and win a few, a few tough games there. And, and then by the time Ray comes back, you know, these guys are playing at an even higher level. And, and that's, that's what I think is the most important, um, you know, thing that's unfolding right now is, okay, we're getting Curbell a little bit more confidence. And uh, DeMonte's, like I said, starting to expand his game a little bit. Um, Adam Miller is, is, you know, he wasn't as assertive offensively today, but I, I didn't think he needed to be. So I, I thought that was something that, um, that showed, you know, maturity on his end as a freshman. It was like, you know, I had 18 last game. I was out. I'm going to get my customary 12 to 13 looks. I thought he was super patient, took what the defense gave him, and, and, and that's what you have to do against Wisconsin. So moving forward, as you go into March, once Io rejoins his team, you know, you're looking at a bunch of guys who are, are trending upward just on a personal level. Um, and, and I don't think that's, you know, I don't think you'd ask for much more as, as an Illini fan, as, as Brad Underwood. Or, or really as any of these guys on the team, um, they're, they're, they're clicking at the right time, that's for sure. Hey, Mike, I want to expound a little bit on uh, Trent Frazier. We were talking about him and also DeMonte Williams. Just the, the senior leadership that they have, knowing that they have, you know, one of their, uh, you know, their top player down and everything, they're taking the, you know, the leadership role as they should. And Trent, you know, has uh, probably always been a fan favorite in Champaign and you know he knows down the stretch he knows what's at stake too with this team and you know he wants to go out possibly I mean I know there's always a chance that he could come back as as well as DeMonte but he wants to go out knowing that this team has a chance to do uh, what they've set out to do all along so just you know it's the senior leadership and uh, just talk a little bit about that. Yeah I think you know anytime you look at you know people say senior leadership and um you know, I'm sure there's, there's other, there's seniors throughout the, you know, throughout the course of college basketball that maybe people wouldn't look at as a leader. And, and, you know, just because you are a senior doesn't make, doesn't automatically make you a leader. And I think Trent and DeMonte have earned that, that title through just through what they've done uh, in their career. I, I go back to Trent Frazier and, and Doug alluded to it a little bit here where you say, yeah, he came in as, as really a bucket getter, um, you know, and then, it's, I, I can't stress how difficult it is and how, um, how much it speaks to Trent's maturity to go from being the bucket getter to ushering in Io and Kofi and, and really taking that look at yourself in the mirror and saying, okay, where, where do I fit in here? Um, you know, I'm not going to get as many looks as maybe I got my freshman and sophomore year um, or my freshman year. And, and I, I think with that comes just an absolute – just, you're on a whole other level maturity wise because you not only go from, okay, I'm maybe not scoring as much. Okay. Where can I help out the team? All right. Defense. I, I had like, that's, I gotta be the guy. And, and he's turned into the guy and he's turned into, like Brad said, you know, he's a, he's a first team, all defense uh, kind of guy in the big 10. And then DeMonte, you know, look, you look at a guy in his first couple of years, you know, played sparingly. And I, I remember even, even, talking about it his freshman year, he just always seemed to be a right place, right time kind of guy. Uh, whenever, whenever a ball, a ball came off the basket, DeMonte was there to grab it. He just, Hey, you just happened to be in the right spot. And that's not by, that's not by mistake. That comes by playing, that comes by being in it, in the trenches. And, um, and as his career has gone on, even he carved out a role for himself. You know, no one would look at DeMonte as the three point specialist, uh, you know, early on in his career. And he's become that because that's what this team needed. Um, this team was not a great three-point shooting team last year. And then now you look at them, they're, I'm sure that they were 39%, five for eight today. So I'm sure that that might go up a tad, but, um, but that's, he's a big reason why they're a top 15, uh, you know, shooting team in the country. Um, and that also stems a lot from the playmaking that's going on to, to get more guys open shots. So um, I, you're exactly right though. You know, the, the senior leadership is, is huge on this team. And I'll even throw Io into that category. I know he's a, he's a junior, but just upperclassmen, you watch him on the bench and putting his arm around Andre Corbello when he comes out after a turnover. I can't, I, I can't say enough of how invaluable that is. Um, not only just for this year, not only for this team, but when you're Andre Corbello, when you're Adam Miller, when you're these guys and you see that senior leadership and you see what it does for your team, 
it's what makes programs great. It's, it's what makes Villanova Villanova. It's what makes a lot of these teams sustain success because now Andre Curbelo in two years, he's, or even next year, he's putting his arm around the next freshman that's struggling. And then, you know, it's a, it's a ripple effect. It's a domino effect. It continues to happen. And that's how you build a great program. So can't say enough about, about those two guys and their leadership. Mike, I got one more question for you. I'm going to totally flip the script here. I know you coached the TBT, you know, tournament, you know, the House of Pain this past summer. And in the height of the pandemic with everything, how, you know, keeping everybody healthy and making sure that people were still locked into their bubble. Brad Underwood's talked excessively, in the, especially in the last couple of weeks, about how good of a job that they have done, the Illinois team-wise, in staying, you know, healthy, no positive cases. How did you guys do it, you know, in that uh, protective bubble and just, you know, keeping everybody, uh, you know, safe and, and all that? Just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, obviously, knock on wood, you know, Illinois has been fantastic with the way that they've, they've treated this uh, with the utmost uh, sense of urgency where it's like, hey, you know, we're all on the same page here. We all know we're all striving for one single goal. Um, so we can't have guys, you know, going out to, to restaurants after games or, you know, I'm sure they're not even spending as much time with family as, they, as they'd probably like to. And, and, you know, you'll have time for that after the season. But going back to the TBT, um, the tough part about it was, you know, leading up to the TBT, we knew once we got there to Columbus, you basically got to hope that guys uh, were doing the right thing. And, and that's why we kept that constant line of communication um, a month before, three weeks before, two weeks before arriving to Columbus. And you basically have to pose it like, if this means a lot to you, you won't go play in those open runs. Um, those five on five games in your hometown. Like if this means a lot to you, you know, you're not going to go, go to that house party or go to that, you know, there's a family party. I think it was maybe Laurent or somebody, somebody had a family party of like 40 people uh, like a week and a half before the, uh, before the tournament. And these guys understood what was, what was at stake. And, and, you know, in order for this to be a great experience, there needed to be buy-in across the board and even once you got to Columbus, you know, we had a, I'm not going to name names, but we had a player who, who woke up the first day after we were in Columbus and we do this health survey and he checked off uh, sore throat and, and we were all like, oh my God. So, you know, and ended up, you know, he, he, he wasn't positive. Um, he still tested negative, but there was never, and I'm sure these guys have felt that there's just a different type of stress and it's a different type of pressure. I mean, every single day, you're testing and hoping that everything you've worked for isn't going to, you know, isn't going to fall flat on its face just, just based off of an asymptomatic uh, positive test. And I'm sure these guys feel that every day. And that's, that's the mental aspect that I think the coaches talk about is you never truly feel like you're out of the woods uh, when it's something you can't see uh, it's something going around in the air and, and spreads just like, you know, just like some other viruses spread, like that's, that's scary. And, and it's scary when you think about, uh, you know, what it means for this program who missed the NCAA tournament last year um, because it didn't happen. And you want to do everything in your power to make sure that, you know, come hell or high water, we're going to, we're going to be an indie. Mike, I think the player that has probably stepped up the most in my eyes over the last two games in Iowa's absence has been Jacob Grandison. We see him today. He gets just five points, but he leads the team with eight rebounds. He was a team high plus 17 and the plus minus. And then, against Nebraska, I think he had 14 points. So he's really stepped it up in Iowa's absence. What have you seen from him that has really made a difference for Illinois over the last two games? I think when you look back at any national contending team, you know, over the years, teams that have won the national championship, every team has a Jacob Grandison. Like in some way, shape, or form, a guy that's selfless, doesn't care about the box score, give me every rebound that comes my way, um, you know, completely selfless. And, and, and I think – what he's started there were there were instances in the beginning of the season where you know he comes in and it's just for a couple minutes and that's tough that's really really hard um I even lived that when I played at Illinois where you know when you crack the rotation and you know you're getting in there and it may be for two minutes the entire game I mean it's a completely different mentality where you're like you know I just don't want to make a mistake in these two minutes because when you make a mistake in those two minutes those two minutes are gone you won't have those two minutes the next game. And I thought, you know, the more and more that he showed, and I thought it all started with the Penn State game. Um, 
and really kind of the Northwestern game as well, where he had these timely offensive rebounds, these hustle plays. And for a coach like Coach Underwood, that's your ticket onto the floor, period. If you can guard, you can make those toughness plays, you're sure with yourself in terms of taking care of the ball, you're going to play. And I think as, he's, as he continues to see, you know what, I'm staying on the floor, that's a completely different mentality. I think back to the, to the Baylor game when Georgia – everybody remembers the, the first half Georgie had in that Baylor game. It's because Kofi had two fouls and he knew he wasn't coming out. Like there's, a, there's just a completely different mentality when you're, not, when you're not looking over your shoulder. And for Jacob Grandison, like he's found his identity on this team. And that can't be, you know, talked about enough when, when, you, when you have all these guys who know their role, who aren't worried about like, – that's the problem with Wisconsin. I think you have four or five guys in Wisconsin who think they should be the leading scorer. And, and that, that's just you, – you can't win like that. You, you can't win consistently like that. Um, and there's plenty of teams that, that have that. So, Jacob Grandison, I can't, I can't say enough about – and there's been all these guys who have stepped up in different ways. But, but him, I mean, you see, since he's been inserted in the starting lineup, I, I believe they're 9-1. and one. Um, I'd have to fact check that. But I'm pretty sure that's, that's what they are. And – and, and it's given DeMonte, you know, a different change of pace coming off the bench. And obviously he started today. Um, but Jacob Grannis, man, like, I, I'll go back to it. Any, any team that's contending for a national title over the years has a Jacob Grannis. And, and, and the Illini are lucky they have him. You hit on Georgie Bichonishvili there a little bit. He's had a really kind of a roller coaster season. He's had some highs. Obviously, you mentioned the Baylor game, and he played really well at other times. Today, I thought he was really good on the defensive end. Early when he first checked in, he – Made things really difficult for Micah Potter, Nate Reavers. He's so active on that end. And then offensively, he went three of four. I feel like today was one of his better games of the season, evaluating his performance. What did you kind of see in that game against uh, Wisconsin today? Yeah, I think, uh, I think you're exactly right. I think there were, you know, for Georgie, I thought it was one of his better games. The only, the only thing, the only constructive criticism that I'll give Georgie is he's got to box out. Like there, I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of moments in that game where, and, and it's not that he doesn't want to go get the rebound. He does. But when, those, when a lot of those shots go short like they were for Wisconsin, those are tough ones to grab if you don't hit and get. So, you know, that was my only problem I had with Georgia Day. Other than that, you know what he's bringing to the table from an energy standpoint. I think at times he gets a little, he gets a little rambunctious and, and moves his feet a little bit, gets a little shuffling going, and, and that's what leads to the, to the traveling. But um, – and he had that, he had that right hand hook today where I thought he probably should have passed it out. And he ended up making the shot. It was a big shot too. I believe it was 42, 36 at the time. Um, and he, he makes it an eight point game or 40, 34. Um, and, and I think that's what you need from Georgie moving forward. You don't need Georgie to score 15 points for him to have an impact. He brings energy. He needs to rebound at a high level when he's in there. And if not, it may not even just be rebounding box out. You may be, that's the thing with Nana. When you look at Nana Egwu, when, you know, when I played there, his rebounding numbers, I think were maybe, I think he was like five a game, but he boxed out and, and, and he made sure that other guys got it and he made sure his guy didn't. So um, that's what Georgie has to, the mentality Georgie has to have is there's plenty of athletes and corbello has got a nose for the ball. Adam Miller's, you know, been so much better tracking and reading balls off the rim. DeMonte, same thing. Um, Trent can stick his nose in there. Io, obviously six, five, six, six. Um, even when he's in there with Kofi, Georgie, your job is hit your guy or hit any guy in there that's near you. Get, clear somebody out so that somebody else can grab it. And if it's in your vicinity, then go up and get it. But, uh, but he's going to be another pivotal part. You know, this is an eight-man rotation, nine-man rotation once Io comes back. And so you can't have a lot of letdown. You can't have um, holes in the armor, if you will. So, um, so yeah, I was impressed with him in, in the minutes that he had today. And and I think he has even more to give. The last one that I guess I have, I thought Coleman Hawkins probably had his best stretch of the season in his first three or four minutes. He had a block, an assist, defensive rebound. I think he had a dunk. And then he struggled in his second stint. But that first stint, I feel like, really should inspire Illini fans to what us in the media have been saying, what we've seen out of him and what Brad Underwood has said. Do you kind of agree with that assessment with – the way he played today in those three, four minutes? I do. Uh, I do agree with him. And I think I tweeted it last game with Adam Miller, but, um, but you can tell when Coleman Hawkins is confident, he has a different type of athleticism to him. 
he has a different type of, of bounce. He has a different type of, of movement. And, and I think when he gets tight and he, he becomes a little bit robotic and, and I don't really know how else to explain it, but, but I'm sure you guys see the same thing where when he, when he gets that block shot, when he gets that, you know, that alley-oop land, uh, he just moves differently. And, and I think that's moving on to next year. You know, you may not have too much of him moving forward. You may get, you know, five to eight minutes maybe from him, if that. But moving into next year, I think he's a guy that takes a massive leap forward because, you know, just like Georgie, just like, a, you know, Grandison, he's going to be in a position next year, you know, where he's not going to be looking over his shoulder at a guy coming to the scores table, uh, you know, oftentimes. So, uh, so his role just really has to be, hey, take care of the ball. Don't get ripped by Brad Davidson and, and, and get some rebounds. And not even – you don't even have to block shots, but alter shots. Um, and make toughness plays. Like his job should be pretty simple right now. You're not asking a ton of him. So that's why it looks so bad when he, when he does some of the things he does and Underwood gets in his face. But, um, but yeah, I, I think he's shown flashes and he's shown enough for, I think, for Illini fans to, you know, to be pretty optimistic about his future. Mike, there's, there's one thing that us, those of us who cover sports are usually reluctant to talk about, and that's officiating can come across sounding like uh, excuse making at times. We try to avoid the topic, but I, you know, I think with all the fans talking about it, we'd be doing a disservice to them if we didn't talk about it, officiating in the Big Ten Conference. And, um, you know, and my complaint is not necessarily that, the, that it's changing games directly, changing the outcome of games, so much as it's changing how you can play. It's, it's changing um, who, which team can control the pace of the game. And you got to adjust fire, you know, from game to game, depending on how the game is going to be called. And when you get into the postseason, and especially into the NCAA tournament, uh, with a different crop of, um, of officials and the games being called differently, I think it's going to hurt Big Ten teams when they get into big dance. So I'd like to get your take on Big Ten officiating this year. Is there, is there a fix for it? Is it something that the coaches should go public with and talk to the league commissioner? Or are they just got to let it ride and, and, and do the best they can? Yeah, and, and I think I've this is this is something uh, my my right state coach always says. Um, you know, when when we'd have guys on our team that were complaining about the refs, or I got fouled, or I got you know this and that, he always used to say that the the team that was complaining about the officiating was the team typically getting their butts kicked. Um, that was always his way of framing it, and and I think that's always stuck with me to where you know I, I and and I think any Illini fan that's listening to this right now is expecting the, the next name to come out of my mouth to be Kofi. And I, I think when you look at Kofi Coburn and if you just take every single play, clip it up and run each play, you could say probably 70 to 75% of the time that there's a foul, um, some sort of contact, some sort of foul on Kofi Coburn. Now, when you go back to the officials, you also have to understand that these are humans. Um, you know, this isn't, this isn't a technology where, you know, you, you, it's not like a strike zone technology where, Hey, it was a strike or it was a, it was a ball. You know, this is, these are humans that are making these calls and, and you have to almost understand like, Hey, put yourself in their shoes. Would you call foul every single time Kofi got the ball? You probably wouldn't uh, because, because you know what that would mean for you as a ref. Um, you know, and, and I think that would even, they probably think that it's shaken their reputation if they call a foul for Kofi every single time. So it's just, it's not going to happen. And I think Kofi, Kofi has got to understand. I, I've seen Kofi, this is the, you know, this game and the Michigan State game are the two times I've seen Kofi the most frustrated. Um, and I think part of it is because I think he hears the talk. And I think he's, and, I, and part of it is I think he's buying into it a little bit um, that he is getting fouled every time. And I'm sure he feels it, but, it, you know, a foul on, a, a 290 pound guy probably feels a little bit different than a foul on a 170 pound guy. And, and I know that sucks to hear. And I think, and everybody wants to say that officiating should be called the same way every single game. And Hey, if it's a foul, it's a foul. But I mean, that's just, that's just not the way it works. And, and I think what the Illini have to do moving forward is, you know, once you get to the NCAA tournament, I, I don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that, you know, if you come out of a conference that's, that's this bruising conference that, you know, a lot of fouls, a lot of, you know, touch fouls, or, or they let you play. I mean, it's one or the other. I'm not sure, like, if you're a team like Illinois, I'm not sure that really has any bearing on, on what you do in the tournament. 
uh, I think their principles are always going to be their principles where, hey, we play hard, we defend, uh, we look for good shots in the offensive end. And, you know, if you get fouled, you get fouled. I mean, the, the ironic part about it is, you know, Illinois wants more fouls when they're not a particularly good free throw shooting team. So, um, except for at the end today, of course. But, uh, but yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not big on, on the officiating uh, side of things in terms of, you know, I think Illinois has enough built-in excuses that they could have uh, with Io out and, hey, we're playing this condensed schedule. We're going on the road three times in a row. If you start getting the officiating thing too, and, and I don't think they are, um, you know, I think they're trying to be above that and they're going to let the, the Illini fans handle, you know, you know, kind of uh, handle all that on Twitter. But, uh, but yeah, no, I think it's something that, you know, you, you take every possession as it is. Uh, if it's a foul, if it's, it's a foul, if it's not, then we're on to the next play. And that's kind of how you have to view it. You know, one, one, one more thing on this topic. I'm going to let you and Brad close, close this out. Um, today we saw Kofi come out the last few minutes of the game. And so it's a bit of a quandary for Coach Underwood. You know, in a close game down the stretch, you want points. And with I.O. out, uh, Kofi is your biggest scorer. And you want to get the ball inside. But do, do you want to throw it to him in the post and have him get fouled and, and, throw, and put him on the free throw line? So today down the stretch, he took him out. And, and uh, luckily, Illinois got uh, Trent Frazier to the free throw line. And, and they got Curbelo to the free throw line. But are we going to see more of that? Uh, down the stretch and in the NCAA tournament with Kofi taking the seat at the end of the game? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I, I think it's a good move. And I think deep down, you know, Kofi's, Kofi's a competitor. I'm sure he wants to be out there. But, um, but I think it's all time and situation. Uh, I certainly don't think you need to do it if you're up eight. Um, you know, or, or once it gets down to maybe a, a one or two possession game, I think that's when you think about uh, – or, or I guess when it, once it gets down to one or two possession game and they're still fouling, that's maybe when you think about it. Um, but if it's a one or two possession game and they're just going to play it out, you certainly want Kofi Coburn in the game. Um, that's the best way to, to get somebody to the line. And I think in those situations, you know, the more that you can get quality shots like Kofi does around the rim, you know, the more you want to have him in there. But it's all time and situation. I thought, I thought it was the right call today. Yeah, I agree with Mike there. I think taking him out in that situation was the right play. I think the one thing you do differently is you maybe throw fewer – times when you throw it to him at the post with his back to the basket in those situations, you get him on ball screens, getting moving, getting lobs, things like that, where it's not where he can catch and get a quick foul. So you, you saw that at the end with the uh, screen roll replace and he got the easy dunk with Grandison throwing it down to him. And those are the kind of situations you can put him in where it's not like an easy hack a shack type thing with Kofi. The one thing I, I will, I got to chime in a little bit on the officiating with Mike with the, I got to disagree just a little just because I hate the way they defend big guys and big girls, uh, you know, girls basketball, boys basketball, whatever it is. I just hate the way they, they allow them to be laid upon, pushed upon. And, and it, yeah, he's 290 pounds and he can handle it. But I feel like they let a lot go just because he's 290 pounds. I don't mind the pushing because he can handle that. I just hate when a guy's shooting and he gets hit on the arm. And, and we've seen that happen to him three or four times. That's the one thing. Everything else, you know, whatever, you know, he gets bumped, he can handle that. But I, I hate when they let a guy get hit on the arm because if a guy's shooting a three, if a guard's shooting a three and he gets hit on the arm, they call that a foul every time. But if a guy inside shoots from five feet, it's still got to be a foul. That's the one that I think they got to take away because I think it frustrates Kofi um, a lot when that happens. And I know Brad has, he's talked about it. You know, he, he sent, they've sent videos to the Big Ten office, the officials and said, hey, this is not called a foul. This has got to be a foul. But you know, at the end of the day, you notice today he didn't mention it because he's like, you know, when they win and when things are going well, I don't think he's going to mention it. I think he's just behind the scenes stuff. And he doesn't want, like Mike, one good point that Mike made was, I think Kofi's starting to think about it now and it is affecting him. You can see him getting frustrated. And so that's the danger as a coach. When you, when you do call that out, it does create a little bit of like, you know, he sees it. It's like, I'm getting fouled. I'm getting fouled. And, and then even when you don't get fouled, sometimes you think you get fouled. So um, yeah, I, I, th I see both sides, but I, I just wish they call the ones when they hit him on the arm because it is so hard to shoot when guys are hitting you on the arm. And I think, I think too, he's Kofi's a bit of a, a prisoner of his own strength. And, you know, <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and defend officiating, but there's times where specifically I know exactly which one you're referring to. It's the second half where he went back to his left hand. Um, and it's so funny. You see him get hit on the arm 
but it did it almost looked like it didn't impede his shot at <laughs> yeah. all I mean that, that's what's tough about it is if you're I think that the constant struggle as a referee is deciding whether or not it impacted the shot obviously it did um but that's always that fork in the road like you know split second call they have to make like it's if it's blatantly obvious because quite honestly I thought there were maybe two or three this game where I didn't even really think Kofi got it was like touch fouls and they called them. Yeah. Um, you know, I, they had one early on and then one pretty early in the second half where I was like, I don't know if that was a foul. And, and that's, that's credit to Brad Underwood because he's planting the seed and that's what good coaches do. They plant the seed and you at least want the referee thinking about it. Like if you can put the yeah. referee in a pretzel and do a little mental gymnastics there, like, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's something that uh, that's what good coaches do. So uh, I think moving forward, you know, to answer, you know, to answer your question, Doug, when it, when it comes to the end, you know, end game scenario, I mean, think about it. You got, we're going to have IO back in those scenarios too. So you become even, even more dangerous uh, end of game. And building off of that uh, quick turnaround this week, guys, uh, just to close this out Tuesday night, they traveled to Ann Arbor to take on the number three team in the country, watch them play today. And very impressive again, uh, just kind of cruised to an easy win today. They look like they're, Michigan looks like they're playing as good as anybody in the country, and that includes Gonzaga and uh, Baylor, who for, for the whole season have really been clearly the best two teams in the country, but Michigan is right there now with them. Uh, first of all, is I.O. going to play? Uh, you know, and then uh, let me know what you think. We'll go around the horn. Uh, who, who do you like in the game at Michigan on Tuesday night? And start with Jim. Well, I – Thought there was an off chance that I.O. might play today, but, you know, uh, hearing the reports that came out late last night, early this morning, kind of changed my mind on that because it's hard to keep a guy like I.O. down. But uh, knowing what's at stake, I think that they'll try to make every opportunity for him to play Tuesday night. I know it's in a, you know advent of safety that you don't want him to get uh, further hurt and everything, but uh, like Underwood said, you know, it's the doctor's uh, choice what they're going to do. I expect it to be a close game up in Ann Arbor, but if if Io plays and is anywhere near 100%, I think Illinois, I, I can't see them winning the ball game, but I, I can't see it being a blowout either. So I'll say Michigan by four points up in Ann Arbor. Mike, who you got on Tuesday? Well, first things first, I don't see a, a world, a universe, a galaxy where Io Desumu doesn't play in this game. Um, in terms of his injury, I, and this is just me speculating just from watching it, and the reason why I typically got when there's plenty of guys that have broken their nose and worn a mask and gone out and played the next game, that's what makes me question whether or not there may be like an orbital fracture in there of his cheekbone somewhere. Like that's – that's the question that I would have because uh, it makes wearing a mask harder, right? Like the, the whole point is to put the pressure on the cheeks to alleviate the pressure that's on the nose. And if you have a, a cheekbone or an orbital fracture, that makes it a little bit more difficult. So that's just like, I'll get that out of the way. And then when it comes to the actual game, you look at a few different things, right? You know, there's, you know, when you look at Michigan, there's not a lot of weaknesses to expose. Uh, but the one thing that I will say for Illinois is, how you handle your lineups and your rotations is, is everything because this is a, this is a big team. Aside from Mike Smith, um, you know, Franz Wagner is about six, nine livers, six, seven, uh, Dick Dickerson, seven feet tall. Um, you know, Brooks, Brooks and Smith are on the smaller side, but I think the game, the game is, is what you allow Wagner and, and livers to do, to be honest. I think, I think Kofi and Dickerson will kind of, um, even each other out, if you will. But I, I'm looking at those two guys and, and what you can prevent. Today they were great against Indiana. Um, both were extremely efficient, uh, and, and I think that's where the game that's where the game is. And then and then too, it's just it's being poised and, and understanding that this is a team that that can play in a myriad of different ways. But I think Illinois is the same way. So um, my prediction, and and this is, I want to stress that this is a this is an unbiased prediction but I, I do if I if Iowa plays on Tuesday I think Illinois wins that game Sturdy well so based on my, my thoughts I, I think Iowa wants to play very badly I don't think he's going to play on Tuesday I think the goal is getting back for the Ohio State game um, I think he wants to play 
I think he's going to try and play. I mean, he's going to do everything he can. Um, I think they are concerned because I think there is more than just a broken nose, and, and that's the issue right now. And so I, I don't think he's going to play. I, I don't like the matchup because I don't like the length that uh, Michigan has on the wing, like Mike mentioned, and that's given Illinois trouble um, this year. So, and, and it's at Michigan. And, and I, I thought one comment that Brad Underwood made the other day um, it's, was talking about not really – and I know he didn't mean it completely, but he talked about he didn't really care about winning the Big Ten title. Or he didn't, you know, it didn't matter about winning the Big Ten title because of the way the schedule has been screwed up and teams not playing the all the games they were supposed to play and things like that. So when he made that comment, I kind of thought in my head, what's it, you know, what's the angle there? So and he, and he made a comment. He actually called out Michigan today. It was interesting today when he said, you know, we're the kind of team who's going to, uh, you know, play just when we want to or whatever. You know, we're going to avoid games that are tough. So, you know, they're going to go play. I think they'll compete. It's probably going to be a better game even without Io. If he doesn't play, I think it's going to be a better game than people think because Illinois does have some abilities to do some things against Michigan that, um, that other teams may not. And so I think they can match up pretty well, except for the wings. And I think the wings will be the difference without – if Iowa plays, then I, I, it could be, like Mike says, I think if Iowa plays, if he's able to come back, he's going to come out with some – he's going to have fresh legs. He's going to have a ton of energy. And I think they could pull the upset. So we'll see. Last but not least, uh, Alec Bussey. Yeah, I don't know how much I expect Iowa to play either, considering when you listen back to the things that Brad Underwood said after the Nebraska game, which was the first time that we really got to hear what he said about Iowa's injury. He kind of didn't just say it was a broken nose. He kind of said that there was something else going on there without being exactly clear of what exactly what was going on. Um, I really echo exactly kind of what – Sturdy said there with the wings and how good Franz Wagner has been for Michigan this year. His length, I think, could really bother Illinois <coughs> the fourth position. Um, he, Jacob Grandison, I know I praised his play earlier, but Wagner's a guy with incredibly long arms. He's one of the best defenders in the Big Ten, in my opinion. He is the best defender in the Big Ten. And then also, I think you look at what Hunter Dickinson has been able to do this year for Michigan at the five position. That matchup with Kofi's going to be really entertaining to see, but Dickinson's been really successful about slowing down other better bigs in the Big Ten. He did a great job against Luka Garza. Garza was really inefficient on Tuesday night. I didn't get a chance to watch the end of the Indiana game, but he did a pretty good job against Trace Jackson Davis today on Saturday as well. So that matchup in the paint is going to be really interesting. But I think for Illinois to find a way to get on get on the winning end without Io is you're going to have to have some sort of heroic performance from some player that – Maybe you haven't had this entire season yet, and maybe that's an Adam Miller going for 20-plus points and finally breaking out like Brad Underwood has said he's been able to do with his three-point shooting. But when you look at how successful Michigan has been against Big Ten opponents this year, I mean, they're up there with Baylor right now in the efficiency rankings in terms of Kempom. They're the only team other than uh, – they're the – one of three teams over 30 in Kempom right now. They're, they've, they're top 10 offensive and defensive efficiencies. Like they're at a different level right now in the Big Ten. And you have to have a lot of respect for what they've been able to do. And I know they haven't had the most difficult schedule, but I'm going to give the nod to Michigan. It's at home. Jawan Howard's got those guys playing really well. And they haven't really struggled since their COVID break. And they're one of the few teams that hasn't. So I'm going to give the nod to Michigan, even if I was able to play on Saturday or on Tuesday. All right, that'll do it today for the Orange and Blue News podcast. Thanks, gang, from Orange and Blue News. Michael Tulip, thanks again so much for coming on with us and giving us uh, your insight, which is always so great. Um, go, go to www.illinois.rivals.com, orangeandbluenews.com, and uh, use Illinois 30 and get a 30-day uh, free trial to Orange and Blue News. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.